to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. What does the Bible say that a person has to do to become a Christian? There could be no greater question in all the world than the question found in Acts 16, verses 30 and 31. What must I do to be saved? We hope that you'll get your Bible and stay tuned as we're going to think about what the Word of God says concerning the matter of salvation. Welcome to the Gospel of Christ program. My name is Ben Bailey, and we're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. Today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. Those members of the Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their worship assembly. If you've got a Bible question or there's something you'd like to study, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God together with you. Also, at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. You can log on to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, and all our Bible study material is free of charge and available to you. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, whether on DVD or CD, we'd love to send that to you. You can fill out a media request form from our website, or you can call us toll-free at one 855 458-3905. On our website, we have a host of Bible study material, including transcripts, study question, question and answers, and a variety of study materials that would help you in your study of the Word of God. Friend, at the Gospel of Christ, we're concerned about the salvation of souls. That's our main emphasis. We're not concerned about your wallet. We're not concerned about hidden agendas. We just simply want to help men and women know the Word of God and to go to heaven. And so as we transition to our study today, we hope that you'll get your Bible out and have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God together. As we think about the great question, what must I do to be saved? How does one become a Christian? Friend, the, understand well, there are a lot of man's opinions that are given about this. Some people say, all you've got to do is believe. Others say, you've got to follow our tradition. And then some will say, you know, just say the sinner's prayer. All we're worried about today is, what does the Bible say? What does God say from His Word? and backed up by Scripture that a person must do to be saved. And so we're going to talk about God's very simple and plain plan of salvation and let the Bible be the answer to that. But friend, as we do that, please realize, we want you to know up front that the reason this lesson is being presented is because we want people to go to heaven. And more than anything, we want you to know that God loves you. And God wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, and 2 Peter 3, and verse 9. And as we think about this lesson on salvation, just think about it in your own mind. Maybe right now you say, well, I am saved. Well, here's what we would challenge you to do today. Just think about your own salvation experience. Think about when you obeyed the gospel. Think about how old you were and where you were at and, and the things you did. And, and just for now, make it clear in your mind, this is what I did by which I know I could be saved. Maybe somebody told you to pray this prayer. Maybe you went down front to an altar and somebody told you were saved or, or maybe something different. Just make it clear in your mind right now. And then we just ask each of us, to examine our own experience and see if that lines up with the Word and the will of God. And so, what does the Bible teach a person must do to be saved? First, one has to be willing to listen to or hear God's voice on salvation. In Romans chapter 10, verse number 17, the Bible says this, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. 
If faith comes by hearing and hearing is done by the word of God, then that passage clearly teaches we get faith by hearing, listening to the word of God. Now, you may be asking yourself, well, that's all good and well, but how does that apply to salvation? Friend, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Hebrews eleven six says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so if I can't please God without faith, then faith is essential to salvation, right? How do I get faith? Whatever way by which I get faith is also essential to salvation. Listen again to Romans ten seventeen. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If faith is essential to salvation and I can't get faith without hearing the word of God, then friend, hearing the word of God is also essential to salvation. In the long ago, David said in Psalm 95, verse 7, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And so, yes, a person must be willing to hear the Word of God, but what does it really mean? If we, when we say hear the Word of God, what does that mean? Does that mean just somebody who stands up and says, I've got a message from God, you just take it and do whatever they say? How do you hear the Word of God correctly? Well, the Bible defines what true hearing is for us. For example, hearing the Word of God, first of all, means that I recognize the authority of only God's Word. I want you to think about an example with me from the life of Jesus. Mark chapter 9, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up on that high mountain. There He is transfigured before them. An amazing event occurs. And Peter, because it's so amazing, he says, Lord, he does, he's afraid and doesn't know what else to say, so he says, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. How did God feel about that? God's voice boomed down from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, listen now, in whom I am well pleased. Hear Him. Jesus, if I'm going to hear the Word of God correctly, I've got to realize that Jesus, the New Testament, is God's pattern for man to follow today. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He has the final authority. I've got to do whatever I do in word or deed by the authority or in the name of Jesus. Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. And friend, let's realize this. As we think about hearing the word of God correctly, there is a seriousness involved in that. For on the day of judgment, it's going to be the words of Jesus that I'm judged by. Jesus said, He who rejects me, does not receive my words, has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. And so for practical application, as we think about the plan of salvation, let's realize it's not man's opinions, it's not man's traditions, it's not what somebody somewhere makes up and says you've got to do that matters. If we're going to hear the word of God correctly, I've got to realize this book, is God's a final authority on salvation and what it says and only what it says is what I must give my attention to in listening to God. Secondly, as we think about hearing the word of God and the importance of that, hearing also means that I'm willing to that I'm willing to test, that I'm willing to search and to seek it out and see if what I hear is true. Now, friend, this is one of the major problems that often occurs in religion today. Somebody may be dressed nicely and somebody that people look up to with a religious stature says something and people just rubber stamp it and take it to the bank and feel like that's a message from God without first checking it in their Bible. That's not how hearing is defined in the Bible. In the Scripture, Correctly hearing means that I go to the Word of God to determine if what I'm being told is true to the book and the gospel or if it's a lie. I want you to think about Acts 17.11. Paul comes to the region of Berea. He knocks on the door. He says he's got, you know, he's got a message from God. And Acts 17.11 says these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the Word with all readiness and searched the Scriptures daily to find out if these things were so. Did those people just up and take Paul right at his message? Paul came in and told them the gospel. Did they say, yep, that's, that's got to be right. We believe it right here and right now. They said, no, we're going to search the scripture. They searched the scripture daily to see if what Paul was telling them 
was true to the gospel. And friend, that's the idea. When you hear something, today's lesson, when you hear that, when you hear a lesson given, get out your Bible and check and see if those things are true. That's correctly hearing the Word of God. And friend, God wants you to prove it. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 21 commands that. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Test the spirits to see whether they are of God. Why? For many false prophets have gone out into the world. And so don't just buy into everything you hear, hook, line, and sinker. Check it from the Bible and see if it's true. And then as we think about hearing the Word of God, we need to realize that God places a high importance on carefully listening to His message. Luke 8, 18, take heed how you hear. Mark chapter 4, verse 24, take heed what you hear. Mark chapter 9, verse 7, take heed who you hear. And then do you remember that refrain that occurs in every one of the seven letters to the churches in Asia? To him that has ears to hear, let him hear. God wants man, when God speaks, and the Bible is his spoken word, God wants man to listen up, to pay attention, and to be ready to obey his voice. And so first... When we think about God's plan of salvation, I've got to hear God's word, which leads right into the next step to have faith or believe in Christ. Friend, understand well, the Bible clearly teaches that if a person is not willing to to believe in Jesus and submit to Him as Lord in Christ, he cannot be saved. The Bible clearly says that. John 8, verse 24, Jesus said, Unless you believe that I am He, you'll surely die in your sins. If we don't recognize Jesus as Messiah, as the Christ, as Emmanuel, God with us, then friend, we cannot be saved. In Acts chapter 8, Philip is teaching the Ethiopian eunuch. And they're traveling down the road. And in the process of teaching him, he sees water and he says, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? Here's the condition. If. You believe with all your heart you may. Acts chapter 8, verse 36 and 37. So friend, listen carefully. There's no denying. You've got to believe in Jesus. But just as well, I want you to hear this. The Bible never teaches all I've got to do to be saved is believe. I know. I hear it a lot, probably just like you. There are people who stand up and teach and proclaim that all you've got to do to be saved is believe in Jesus. Friend, the Bible never says faith only will save. In fact, did you know the only time faith only or belief alone occurs in your Bible and mine, it says it won't save? That's right. The only time those two words are combined, God says, the Holy Spirit says, it will not save. Now, let me show you that from the Scripture. Notice your attention to James chapter 2. And I want you to look at what the half-brother of the Lord, James, says in James chapter 2, verse number 24. James says, You see then that a man is justified, just as if I'd never sinned. You see then that a man is justified by works, watch it now, and not by faith only. Only time faith only occurs in the English Bible. And friend, God says, You're not justified by faith only. And friend, as we read our Bible, we recognize that to be true. Matthew 7, verse 21, Jesus said, it's not everybody that looks up into heaven and says, Lord, Lord, that's going there. People acknowledge Him as Lord. They believe in Him, but they're not going to heaven. But Jesus said, it's He who does the will of my Father in heaven. Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. And friend, I remember the words of Jesus well. When he spoke to the religious elite in Luke 6, 46, he asked this striking question. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Don't you remember the admonishment of Jesus? John 14, verse 15, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. And so belief alone is not all it takes. Don't get me wrong, it's essential. The Bible clearly teaches that. But I've got to be willing to do more than just believe in Christ. And friend, along those same lines, 
Sometimes I hear people say, well, to be saved, here's what you need to do. And they've got this little prayer ready, and they say, you need to say the sinner's prayer, and it'll often go something like this. Dear Lord, dear Jesus, I recognize you as Savior. Savior. I honor you as Master. I ask you to come into my heart and life and save me in Jesus' name. Amen. Friend, here's the question I ask. Where is that found in the Bible? Where does the Bible say, to be saved, you need to say this sinner's prayer? Friend, here's what's amazing. You can look from the very first verse, Genesis 1-1, to the very last verse, Revelation 22-21, and not one time will you find that prayer mentioned in the Bible. What? I, we hear it like it occurs all the time. And it's not even in the Bible. That's right. Check your Bible and see. You can't even find that one time in the scripture it is a man-made prayer it's man-made doctrine and it is not found in the teaching of our lord and savior jesus christ now on to the third step once i hear god's word once i believe in jesus i then must be willing to repent of sin in my life repentance means to to change one's way of thinking that leads to a changed way of acting i change the way i feel about my my life I don't do the old things I used to do or I make up my mind, try not to do those things and now I'm ready to follow God. I know repentance is essential to salvation. For Jesus said in Luke 13 verse 3, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Must a man repent of sin to be saved? Jesus said if you don't repent, you'll perish. Acts 2 verse 38, in the first gospel sermon, when he preached Jesus was the Christ, they're cut to the heart with sin. They cry out, men and brethren, what shall we do? The answer is repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Acts 3 verse 19, Peter preached, repent and be converted that your sins might be blotted out, that seasons of refreshing might come from the presence of the Lord. Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Repent that your sins may be blotted out. Repentance is no doubt connected in God's plan of salvation to forgive man of sin and to cleanse him of iniquity. But friend, when we talk about repentance, sometimes there's confusion along those lines. Sometimes people think that repentance is equated with tears and sorrow. And friend, don't get me wrong. Repentance may have that as a part of it, but tears and sorrow alone is not real repentance. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10, the Bible says, Godly sorrow produces repentance. Not godly sorrow is repentance. Feeling sorrowful, even in a godly way, about sin may lead one to repentance. That implies that sorrow alone is not repentance. Well, what is repentance? In Luke chapter 3 verse 8, we learn that repentance demands a changed life. Certain people came out to John to be baptized of him and these are the religious elite who want to do it it looks like because everybody else is doing it and John said you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come bring forth fruits worthy of repentance and do not say to yourselves we've got Abraham as our father. John clearly taught them repentance has fruit. It has some kind of indicator in one's life that a person is trying to change. Does that mean we're going to be perfect? That's not what we're saying. Nobody is perfect. We're not, from time to time, we do make mistakes. We do mess up. But friend, we're trying. We've turned from the old and we've turned to the new. And thus, we want to put on the new man and put off the old man as the Scripture teaches us throughout the books of Colossians and Romans. Now, let's move to that fourth step in God's plan of salvation. Once I have heard the Word of God, I believe the evidence that Jesus is the Messiah and I'm willing to change my life. The Bible also teaches I must confess, acknowledge with my mouth that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. In Romans 10 verse 10, the Bible says it this way. With the heart or with the mind, one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. We see an example of that in Acts chapter 8. Verse 36 through 38. You remember we mentioned earlier that Philip is traveling down the road with the Ethiopian eunuch. They come to a certain water. Here's water. What hinders me? If you believe with all your heart, you may. And Peter said these words. Or, or Ethiopian eunuch said these words. I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that's what we're talking about. Making the good confession. And you can know 
That is an essential part of salvation. Here's why we know that. Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33, If you won't confess me before men, neither will I confess you before the Father who is in heaven. If you will confess me before men, I'll also confess you before my Father who is in heaven. Is it necessary that I acknowledge Jesus as the Christ to be saved? Jesus indeed said that it was. Now, sometimes people want to stop short in what the Bible teaches about salvation. But friend, the Bible teaches there is another essential element, command, that God wants man to do to be saved. And that is... To be saved, the Bible teaches man must be baptized. Now, listen carefully. I know a lot of people teach and a lot of people claim baptism is something good you ought to do. It's an outward sign of an inward grace, but it is not essential to salvation. Friend, you remember in the beginning of this lesson, we encouraged each of us that what we hear, we check it by the Bible to make sure that's true. That's all we're asking right now. The Bible teaches... Baptism is essential to be saved, not something you do after you're saved. How do we know that? Let's begin by thinking about what baptism is. Sometimes people talk about baptism and they use a rather loose and unbiblical definition for that. And they will say it may mean sprinkling, it may mean pouring, or it may mean immersion. Friend, if one's not immersed in water, he's not met the Bible requirement for baptism. Let me illustrate that. What is baptism according to the Scripture? In John 3, verse 23, John was baptizing in the region of Anon near Salim. Why? Because there was much water there. How much water does it take to sprinkle? Not much. What about to pour a little water? Not much. How much water does it take to immerse an adult? Much water. Listen to the other examples. Romans 6, verses 1 through 4, Paul likened baptism unto a burial. Imagine the last time you went to a burial, a graveside funeral. What did they do with the body? Did they lay it on the ground and sprinkle a little dirt on it? Did they pour a little dirt on it? No. They dug a hole in the ground. They placed that body all the way on the ground. It's covered on the bottom and covered on every side by dirt. And then they completely covered it. They engulfed it. They immersed it. They encased it in the ground. The Bible says baptism is a burial. Not a sprinkling or not a pouring. It's a burial. Now, two other passages. Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. At the baptism of Jesus, it says, As He was coming up out of the water, the Spirit descended upon Him like a dove. To come up out of water, what must you first do? Well, you've got to go down in two. Jesus went down into the water to come up out of it, and thus, for His mode of baptism, He was immersed. And same thing with the Ethiopian eunuch. Acts chapter 8, verses 37 through 39, both Philip and the eunuch stopped the chariot. They got down out of the water. They went into the water. He baptized him, and they came up out of the water. Again, a picture of immersion. You don't find sprinkling in the Bible. You don't find pouring. We find people being immersed for the forgiveness of sin. Now, what then does the Bible teach is the purpose of baptism? We want to direct your attention to these passages with us. The Bible teaches that baptism is essential to be saved. It is essential for salvation. Mark 16 and verse 16, Jesus said it this way, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. Did Jesus say, you just answer the question for yourself from your own Bible. Did Jesus say a person must believe and be baptized to be saved? Friend, if He said that, let's believe it. What about Acts chapter 2, verse 38? Peter stood up with the eleven, proclaimed the gospel. When they wanted to know what must we do to be saved, Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the remission of sins. Does the Bible say you've got to repent and be baptized to have your sins remitted? can't be saved without your sins being forgiven. Does the Bible say you've got to repent and be baptized to be saved, to be forgiven? Acts 22, verse 16, Saul is told, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. At what point is man's sin washed away? It's at the point of baptism, and thus it is essential to salvation. Friend, let's also realize this. Uh, One of the things that the Scripture clearly teaches is that all spiritual blessings are found inside of Christ. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 3. 
2 Timothy 2.10 says that salvation is also in Christ. And so if all spiritual blessings are in Christ, and if salvation is also in Christ, then we've got to ask the question, how does the Bible say a person gets in Christ? And again, it's at the point of baptism. Galatians 3 and verse number 27, the Bible says, As many of us as were baptized, listen, into Christ, have clothed ourselves with Christ. We're baptized into His death. Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. And so, if I want to access all spiritual blessings, and if I want to be in Christ, then I've got to be baptized to get into Christ. Now, I know the objection. Sometimes people will often give objections as it relates to these things. Uh, sometimes people say, you know, that's all good and well, but the Bible never says you, the, the, baptism saves or you have to be baptized to be saved. Friend, it absolutely does. 1 Peter 3.21, baptism does now also save us. That's the explicit language of the Bible. Listen to it again. Baptism doth now also save us. If the Bible says baptism saves, why would we ever make up a doctrine or why would man ever make up a doctrine that says it's not essential? Well, someone says, okay, okay, but the Bible never says you've got to be baptized to get into God's kingdom and go to heaven. It absolutely does. John 3, verse 5, Jesus said, Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so, friend, we ask you today to think about, remember when at the initial part of this lesson, we encouraged each one of us to think about our own salvation experience. We were asked you to think about where you were, how, maybe how old you were, and then to make clear in your mind exactly what steps you took by which you knew you were saved. Friend, here's all we ask you to do now. Hold that up. Look at it in view of what we've studied today. Do the two merge? If they don't match up, then friend, we're encouraging you today. Won't you obey the gospel? Won't you become a Christian? Have you heard the message about Christ? Do you believe He's the Savior of the world? Are you willing to repent of sin that's in your life and turn from it and turn to God? Would you acknowledge Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God with your mouth? Would you be baptized for the remission of your sins? If you haven't done that, you'd like to study more, or if we can help you in any way, please contact us and may God help each of us to every day obey the gospel of Christ. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.